it's Mac Lobel, and he's pouring it on. Mac Lobel in front now by four or five. Napolitano is never going to catch him. The others are far back. Here is a brilliant trotter and a brilliant performance. Mac Lobel has won the Hambletonian in 153 and three, a sensational time, a new record. Welcome to Win the Sulky, and the most accomplished driver in harness history is here, John Campbell, and we just saw some video of Mac LaBelle. John, we lost Mac LaBelle this week. What was your first reaction? Uh, well, it's certainly, I was surprised because I saw him uh, in 2014 in summertime. He looked so great. Um, you know, it was certainly sad to, to hear that he was gone, but I, I knew he had a great retirement and a great life. I mean, he looked so good there in 2014 when I saw him in Sweden, so... I was happy in that regard that I got to see him, and he had such a great life in, in his later years. And he sure gave us a lot of thrills. Let's take us. Let's go back to 1986 to Peter Horton. I believe this is the first time you ever drove Mac LaBelle. What were the circumstances there? Well, Billy uh, O'Donnell had uh, qualified him for the, and he had chose another horse uh, for the final. And Chucky called and said, "I got a colt that can go pretty good, but his mind wanders, and but he can go." So I drove him, and he he raced very well, and. Uh, true to form, as Chucky knew his horse, he, he was. He drifted out a little bit in the stretch and had to keep his mind on his task. And uh, But he could go, and he had a great gait. And that's him right there finishing second in the Peter Horton. Uh, tell us about your relationship with Chuck Sylvester, because Chuck was the first trainer here to have a 55 trotter. That was three years earlier. Uh, he did it with Diamond Exchange. Did you know Chuck then, and how did that work out? I knew Chuck uh, actually back in Detroit before uh, either one of us came out east uh, so uh, I didn't drive for him at that time, but uh, when uh, he came here and his stable grew, I, I started to drive a lot of horses for Chuck, and uh, it, it worked out uh, tremendous for both of us, both on a professional and personal level. You know, he's a very good friend. He and his wife, Sharon, are just very good personal friends of Paul and I, and it's been a relationship that uh, we really cherish and has, has gone on for years. And just when you think Chuck might be somewhere near retirement, he shows up and wins both Valley Victory limbs last year, and then dead heats in the final. So keep it going, Chuck. Let's go to the 87 season because you start off in June 27th with the Yonkers Trot, but he raced 20 times at two. Was that the reason maybe for a little bit of a later start? Well, you, you, yeah, maybe so. We, they didn't have that many stakes early at that time, and, uh, you know, it, it was all up to Chuck what his schedule was, and uh, I had nothing to do with that. I, Whenever he was in, I showed up to drive is basically how that worked for and, his three-year-old year. And Mac had four starts going into the Hambo. Let's take a look at the 87 Hambo as he dominates by five and three-quarter and six and a half lengths in his two heats. And uh, what were you thinking here uh, with, with Mac LaBelle? Well, I was thinking he's going to be hard to catch. He was still trotting good there. My main concern was he not roll off stride. He, his feet were stinging him that day. And getting back to Chuck, uh, that, that's what makes him such a great trainer. We changed his shoes, uh, or Chucky did, in between heats. Uh, I wasn't happy with the way he was trotting, and Chucky says, let me change his shoes, and it did help him. But ap after the wire, he, he made a break, but it wasn't from his mind wandering. His feet were staying in that day, but, but he just went through it with, you know, one of the greatest performances in Hamiltonian history at that point. And that horse who was second, in case anybody's thinking that's an average field, that's Napolitano, who two years later would be the older trotter of the year and win two and a half million himself. John, how about the 87 Breeders' Crown? You already won the, the two-year-old Breeders' Crown at with Mac LaBelle, but the 87 Breeders' Crown to this day remains the biggest margin ever in Breeders' Crown history. Well, we were coming off a loss in the uh, Kentucky Futurity, and he just got beat that day. It was one of the few times that he was on his game, and Napolitano just trotted by him in the stretch in Kentucky, and uh, Chucky and I were both devastated that he, that he lost that race. We were going for the Triple Crown, um, but he sure came back and vindicated himself here. He was just uh, awesome that night. It, it didn't matter who he was in with. Uh, he wasn't losing that race. 12 and three quarter lengths. There he is winning the Breeders' Crown. He'd win the Breeders' Crown at two, three, and four. And now let's take, we're going to talk about the 1988 Elite Lop because four year olds are not supposed to even be in the Elite Lop, never mind win it. Tell us about the Elite Lop and tell us about Mac before you even talk about the race, about training there. Well, Chuck had gone over to train him, and uh, you know, everybody knows he wouldn't train. Chuck tried everything to get him to go, and it was well documented. They had TV and print media out there watching him go, and it was turned out to be embarrassing for Chuck because he couldn't get the horse to go around the track. So we were concerned going into the race and uh, being the, the hardest part of my job was the post parade, keeping him moving in the post parade because I was afraid if he got stopped that I wouldn't be able to get him going. But once I got him to the gate, he was all business and he, he just put on a tremendous performance. They, they always show the second heat of the elite lot, but he was just as impressive or more impressive. He circled the field in front of the grandstand the first time around to make the front uh, 
in that. And I think this first heat was more impressive than the second heat. And then uh, later on that year, the, in the Breeders' Crown's coming up again, you're taking a shot on the half-mile track at the Saratoga uh, half-miler. The record was 56 and 4, 19 years early by Neville Pride. You have a shot at that Mackle Bell, but the weather's not the greatest, and I think Lou Guida couldn't even make it there. Well, I, I don't remember Lou not being there, but I, I do remember Mack, and he had an outside post and uh, trotting out of there. We were out of the gate as, as hard as horses could go, and he was three high around the first turn, and he was just so flawless. You could put a glass of water on his back making him do that. And, uh, you know, he broke a record that had stood for 19 years, which, you know, people thought was one of the tougher re uh, records to break at that point. Yeah, and uh, then later on we had the March of Dimes, which turned out to be one of the great races of all time. Mack goes in as the favorite, 17 for 18 on the year. What a fun race this was. We had horses come from everywhere, literally. Everybody made a million dollars in that career. Arasi, Sugarcane Hanover, No Sex Please, you name it, they showed up. What, what's your memory and recollection there? Well, both Chuck and I knew he wasn't on his game going into the race. Uh, he, he was tired. He'd, he'd had a long year. He started early and he'd gone over to Sweden and back. And he, he was just wasn't as sharp as he'd been, but he sure put in a great race. And uh, I, I remember getting on the bike there and just hoping that we could coax one more big performance out of him in that race and he did come up with a big performance but he, the best he could do was third. And maybe the oddest race of the career of Mac LaBelle to me might have come in 89 when you won the Breeders' Crown with Delray LaBelle and Mac was in the race and you weren't driving Mac. Mac finished third. What was that like? Well it was different. It was you know it, it was tough to get fired off Mac LaBelle earlier in the year. I got uh, taken off the horse so that you know that was something that was really. Three straight good. Breeders' Crowns and you got fired off the horse. Well yeah. <laughs> it's the nature of the, the beast I guess but uh, you know, Mac wasn't himself that year at five. He just wasn't as good as he had been, and uh, I knew that going into the Breeders' Crown, and I thought, you know, if anybody could be close to him at the end of the stretch, he just couldn't finish off his races. And fortunately, I, I had a horse, Delray uh, Lobel, that got close enough to him, and we were able to trot by him in the stretch. And uh, it, it, didn't, it wasn't great feeling for me beating Mac Lobel, I can tell you that. A lot of people thought it would be, you know, I'd be ecstatic about that, but it, it really wasn't because I knew he wasn't on the top of his game. And as a sire, a lot of people here don't know that Mac LaBelle was an accomplished stallion overseas. I think I read he was responsible for 33 millionaires. Pretty serious. Yeah, I, I, he wasn't for racehorse. I think it's, he's had more prominence as a broodmare sire. He was disappointing, I think, uh, as a racehorse sire. But, you know, there's no uh, rhyme or reason why some horses are great sires or not. And it's impossible to predict. And, uh, you know, from, just from my standpoint as a racehorse, he was ahead of his time athletically and gated. Uh, everything about him uh, was, we, we would see in the future, uh, the way horses are gated, but he, he had that gait and speed and athleticism back then. And he was the son of Mystic Park and a $17,000 yearling. I don't think anybody expected that. But then you and Chuck showed that was only a sign of things to come. How about Pine Chip, Muscles Yankee, and Lucky Chucky? Some people, would, maybe in a lifetime, if they had one of those kind of horses, they'd be thrilled, maybe. You guys have teamed up four times for horses like this. Pine Chip, I thought, was one of the greatest trials I've ever seen. He certainly was. When he was, when he was at the top of his game, he, was, he would have been hard to beat by any horse. Uh, but again, I mean, I just rode the coattails of uh, Chucky on the, these horses because he, he did all the work. He developed them. And, you know, I had the easy part. As I said, I just showed up to drive, and uh, uh, th that, that helped me. Tr tremendously in my career on all those horses. And Pine Chip was a great broodmare sire, and he had back-to-back -back Hambo winners, and then Muscles Yankee speaks for herself with three straight Hambo winners. I think Lucky Chucky's a little bit uh, under underrated by people. He was the two- and three-year-old of the year. Yeah, he, he was a tremendous horse. There's no question about that. Uh, as a sire, I mean, it, some people are disappointed in him thus far, but it, it's still early in his career, and, you know, hopefully he'll come up with something here that uh, – We'll, we'll give him a little more prominence in the, this coming year. John, last year with J.L. Cruz, have you, I can't remember a horse holding his form longer than he did last year. It seemed incredible to me. He sure did. He, he got off to a good start. He raced in these series here at the Meadowlands, and it just helped his confidence immensely. Uh, he, he was winning, and he, some, of, some of the nights he won rather easily, and he just kept getting better and better, and then he went to a series in Pocono, and the same thing. He just he, he learned how to win, and... Uh, Eric did a tremendous job when he first started. He was a little bumpy. And he got his gait cleaned up where he was trotting good, and he got so, so much more usable and versatile. And uh, from then on, he just his form just held, and he, he went against the best that were out there and was able to beat them. John, there are eight drivers on the car tonight under 30. You started here at 22. What's your impression of the young guys? Oh, the, 
the talent pool is so deep right now. I, um, I always believe that the top drivers from any era would compete at the top level. They'd learn how to adapt. But having said that, the talent pool throughout North America from guys that are uh, 20 to 35, there's never been so many uh, guys that drive horses as well as there is right now. I'm going to leave you with one John Campbell stat. Let him go. Back in 79, John led the nation in the Meadowlands in earnings. That year, the next 17 drivers in earnings. In 2015, all those drivers combined won one race. Ron Waples, the only one. John's still going at it strong. John, thanks so much for stopping by. Good luck tonight. All right, thanks for that stat too, Bob. You got it.